All right, okay. So for my career, I've spent basically all of it doing security work, right? And one of the things that I've often found is that we skip over the blocking and tackling of doing security. Everybody wants to go to this advanced persistent threat, you know, whatever panda or whatever tiger or, you know, whatever, you know, fancy bear, whatever it is, the, the newest, coolest thing that CloudStrike or any other company decides to put out as far as a, you know, a threat group, and we want to focus on that, and we're looking at, you know, zero-day exploits through a, a novel, uh, you know, process hollowing technique, or, or, or uh, you know, being able to jump PIDs or, you know, VLAN bypass stuff that, you know, exists in a, in a small way. Um, but we don't do things like segment our network, and we don't do things like implement logging or, uh, you know, verify what our firewall rules are on a regular basis, right? Audit the firewalls. Um, these are like the really basic, simple controls of getting security started. And before you can run, you got to walk, right? So fundamentals in network security is kind of, I guess, what we'll call the series. We'll end up doing a series of these presentations over the next, I don't know, maybe year. Um, but one of the things that I've thought about and where I modeled this out was the SANS critical, the CSC, the critical security controls. Anybody familiar with that? So look them up. SANS, S-A-N-S, publishes the 20 critical security controls, right? And it talks about the 20 things that you need to do in order to have a base level of assurance for network security. Well, network segmentation actually fits in about eight of those security controls. Not in the sense of it accomplishes any of them, but it makes them effective and it makes the, the controls possible, right? So I'm going to make a couple of assumptions in this presentation, which is a sufficiently skilled and resourced attacker will get through your network defenses, they will move laterally, and they will exfiltrate data, period. The other assumption that I have always made when I walk in and take over a security gig is that this network is already owned, right? It's already breached. Somebody else has more control over it than I do. I just don't know it yet, right? So the assumed breach philosophy is something that um, I didn't always get, but it's actually a pretty nice set. You can operate in the mode of not panic, right? People panic when they hear, oh, I'm breached now, I'm breached, right? Well, there, there's no need to panic at that point. Actually, at that point is when you probably need to be the calmest, right? You need to be making calm, rational, um, th well thought through decisions. So just operate in the mode that your network is already breached, right? You don't know about it yet. And when you know about it, you're not going to operate any differently other than you're going to start taking remediation steps. Breakout time. So with network segmentation and as we go through the fundamentals of stuff, breakout time was, I, I think, actually probably termed by CrowdStrike. It's their term. But really, it's defined as the time from when the attacker gains a foothold in your network, right? They have access to a box. They have a credential set. They have whatever it is, but they've got an active connection into your network until the time that they move laterally. Everything that we do as security engineers are designed to do two things. Make breakout time increase, right? Meaning make it d more difficult to move laterally and ultimately try and prevent network exfil or d uh, data exfiltration from your network, right? You're never going to keep them from getting in. Your best hope is trying to keep your data from getting out. So we got to define segmentation. And segmentation to me is intentional and sometimes unintentional division of a network control or of a network to control the movement of data within the network as a whole. So subnets, right? Well, kind of, but not really. Subnets are a part of segmentation. Unintended segmentation, right? It happens. Big yellow fiber finders, right? I say that because you will unintend unintentionally segment your network at times. And if you want to be real about it, though, you can intentionally mimic an unintentional separation of the network to gain back control, right? If an attacker has a known foothold in your network and you pull your upstream connection, you've segmented you from them, right? So 
even those methodologies of segmentation have their, uh, their benefits. But segmentation can be difficult and it can be expensive and it means that I have to redesign my flat topology, so why do I even bother? Who's familiar with the CIA triad from Security Plus, right? Confidential, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, right? When we have those three things, our data is considered to be secure, right? So segmentation actually supports this, right, in things like role-based access or data-based access. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it supports many of the SANS 20 uh, critical security controls. But segmentation actually does just more than that. It is a way to increase the effectiveness of the security controls and the appliances that you already put in your network. So I will ask you a question. Does Alice from accounting need the same controls on her network access as Bob in systems engineering? Right. But if we didn't segment our network, Alice and Bob potentially get the exact same access, right? Because we can't apply a network-based security control unless we're doing it at the host level, right, to an unsegmented network. So if our IDS and IPS is at the single flat choke point on the way out the door, Bob and Alice get the same version of network security, right? And that's what we want. So if we segment it and we put choke points out and Bob's on one segment over here, and he has a firewall set of rules of things that he can do and access, right? He has his, a, a different IPS rule set looking for different things, which, by the way, he should potentially have more APT uh, attacking him, at least to gain an initial foothold, than Alice may have uh, attacking her, right? So we can target the rule sets based on the threat models that we have for each one of our departments, the access needs that we have for each one of our departments and each one of our user rules. And by doing so, we don't have to buy 100 gig firewalls, right? We don't have to put everything at one set of the perimeter and buy the most expensive device. We can do things like 100 meg firewalls or gigabit firewalls um, in. We can put much smaller IDS or IPS uh, uh, appliances in. And because of that, we don't have to run all of the IDS or IPS rule sets. So segmentation is really important potentially into reducing the cost of what your security appliances are, but increasing their effectiveness by actually designing a security policy for a segment that matches the intended needs. So there are kind of three main ways to segment a network, really only two, um, which are the physical segment, right? Physical segment meaning network segment A over here rides one set of copper or one set of fiber, and network segment B over here rides another set of copper or another set of fiber. That is an expensive way to segment a network. It's potentially hard to segment it that way, and we'll go into it a little bit more. Another way that you can segment, right, is VLANs, right? We put a different network on the same wire. There are constraints to this, but it can be faster and it can be easier to deploy. Subnetting and supernetting, right? We can take a supernet of a network and give it to subnets, right? And each one of those subnets does a different thing. If they all come back to the central point of control, it isn't really a segmentation. It's a routing decision, right? But if we segment it and subnet it, it makes it easier for th you know, people to understand things. It makes the network more logical, and it actually makes some of your routing and other decision-based controls a part of your uh, security profile. And then we can use a combination of this, right? Any network sufficiently large is going to need a combination of any of these, right? Um, just because I can physically separate in the new branch office that we built over here doesn't mean that my 100-year-old building um, or, or that you know, serves as our headquarters has the ability to run new fiber or the ability to run new copper, right? So I may be able to physically segment in this location. I may not be able to physically segment in another location, right? So if you have a network that's sufficiently large, you will probably end up using a combination of these techniques. So the advantages of physical segmentation are you actually get physical separation of the data, right? Like I said, one's on one wire, one's on another wire, 
If you've got a third one, it's on another wire. If you've got a fourth one, it's on another wire, up to n and n number of wires, right? It's not as prone to software implementation bugs. So there were a number of novel techniques that were introduced at, I think, DEF CON 23, maybe? 22, 23, 24, I don't remember. One of the low 20 DEF CONs. And it was about virtual switches and some actual switches which had software bugs which actually did allow you to hop VLANs, right? That's a bad thing. Physical segmentation generally is not restricted or not prone to those bugs. And it's easier for a networking novice to actually understand it. When you see a red Ethernet cable running over here and you said red is for all of our server segments, right? The guy that's two days out of, you know, his uh, oh, the Cisco cert, the, you know, the CCNA, right? And he's got, you know, two days of experience beyond his, his classroom lab. It's really easy for him to understand that this red cable over here is for servers. This blue cable over here is for accounting. And the yellow cable that runs between them actually runs the VoIP networks, right? It's really easy for people to understand those things. And even if the cables aren't actually in different colors, right? When the data, when the segments are actually physically segmented, it's really easy for you to walk into a switch closet um, and say, oh, okay, I know that this is segment X, this is segment Y, and this is segment Z, and here's how they appropriate relate, right? The disadvantages, though, is that this can be very time consuming. You may have to have completely set up or, or, or you know, multiple sets of switches in order to get these things done, right? If you want true physical segmentation and you've got a VoIP segment that runs to accounting and you've got an accounting segment that runs to accounting, right? Then you need two sets of switches for accounting, just like when Bob's desk phone that sits on the, uh, the VoIP side and his server access box, um, they, when they're physically segmented, right? You need two sets of switches for each one of those. So it can get time consuming and expensive and it may not actually be possible. So if you're in an older building that your company or you have chosen to inhabit, there are certain laws at times where it says a renovation over X number of cost, regardless of what you're actually doing, right? But a renovation of X percentage of the value of the building or over X cost qualifies as a major renovation and you may have to bring the, uh, the building to current code, right? So what was initially, a $25,000 deploying of new cable for network segments is now a $4 million renovation on your building to bring it to current ADA code and other codes, right? So in some cases, it may just not be possible. So virtual segmentation, right? Generally referred to as VLANs. It's potentially faster. If you have a managed switch with the appropriate number of ports already deployed, and you have somebody who knows how to manage a VLAN, right? You can, you can create VLANs in the matter of seconds, right? So it can be very quick. It generally requires less infrastructure. If I'm running straight VLANs, I can put one switch per network segment and, or, or one switch per department, and then I can route the appropriate VLANs out and I can tag the traffic uh, as necessary in and out of each port. And it's frequently cheaper, right? I don't need six different Ethernet uh, runs to each department to uh, deploy the appropriate segments. I need, you know, a pair of redundant Ethernet runs. Um, I don't need multiple switch sets, right? I just have one. But our disadvantages, right? If you're running some of the virtual switching or your switch actually happens to have a bug in the way it handles the, the VLAN separation, you may actually, your attacker may be able to hop VLANs uh, unintentionally. It can be more challenging for your novice engineers to understand. Who here understands how a VLAN tagging and untagging works? Somebody care to explain that to us? In easy terms? How does it practically work? I'll give it a try and Go say... Uh, there are various ports on a switch, and certain ports, sorry, if information goes into, uh, say, the left half of the switch, it will be given a tag for the left half, and if it goes in for the right side, the, the right side will be given a right 
tag, basically. What happens if I don't tag? Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. Is right, that, here's, is that its own area, uh, so, right? You, but the point is made is where it can get very complicated, especially for novice engineers, very quickly, right? You have to understand trunk ports, right? You have to have a port that's capable of carrying every VLAN tag that you want, except for the VLAN tag that you frequently use to sinkhole traffic, right? Like in some cases, we use VLAN 666 to sink traffic that we don't want to go anywhere, right? So understand that I need a trunk port. Well, that trunk port has to be capable of carrying all of those tag traffic sets, right? Not just tag A or tag B. It can have to tag, uh, carry tag A and B, right? But when we look at all of the tags, we may have tag 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You can have thousands of tags, ultimately. But they all ride across the same wire. And when you plug into that port, it may have a default. If you don't tag the traffic, it defaults to VLAN 0, right? Or you can set it to say, hey, if I don't see any tag traffic on this, no network tag, I want it to go to VLAN 6, or 666, right? I don't want any untagged traffic to actually go anywhere. The only thing that should go anywhere is tag traffic. But then that tag traffic has to be able to make it into routing, right? So at some point, a switch has to say, hey, I need to untag this traffic, right? Because it's going to switch and it's going to go down another VLAN and it needs another tag in order to get to the servers, right? It can get really complicated really quickly. And for somebody to walk in and realize that three different LAN segments exist on this particular cable, and it's a trunk line, and that trunk line is then going to redistribute traffic in the switching configuration, um, is not exactly easy. So um, understand that there's a cost to that, and it's generally a learning cost. But there's also no physical separation. So in some cases, if you're dealing with particular regulation sets, they say that this type of data has to be not just segmented, but it has to be physically segmented right, from the remaining sets. So it used to be that in the PCI STIGs that it had to be physically segmented. Now, depending on how they your assessor reads it, you may or may not be able to get away with VLAN separation, right? But, um, you know, in the DOD set, right, this classification of traffic has to be physically segmented, not virtually segmented. So um, because there's no physical separation, right, VLAN is not necessarily going to be an appropriate way to do that each time. So subnetting and supernetting. You can have a properly segmented network all on one subnet. It is possible. Man, it's going to be a pain in the butt, <laughs> right? To understand and say that I'm going to deploy even just a slash 24, but parts of the slash 24 are going to behave differently. We can make that happen, right? But it's, it's not fun. It's not easy. It's difficult to understand that 192.168.6.43 and 192.168.6.56 are completely different in how traffic is handled, right? Generally, what we want to do is apply a subnet to a segment, a subnet of an appropriate size, and handle all of the traffic from that subnet in the same manner. We have RFC 1918, which gives us a boatload of subnets that we can use. Um, and then there's some even newer subnet sets, right, that we can use that are non-routable addresses where we can nap behind, uh, you know, routable uh, addresses and, and appropriately segment our traffic as necessary, right? Do you mean by changing the net mask? Well, well if you have a slash 24, mm -hmm. 255, Boxes, okay. Yep. The way I understand the segment is that if I provide, well, I don't understand. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, continue. So I'm glad we're doing this, right? I can take a 24 and I can put everything into the same gateway, right? So I can have 192.168.1.0 through 255, right? Zero is really not a usable address in that sense. We're going to have dot one is the gateway and dot 255 is the broadcast. That's generally how we do it. And it leaves us 252 addresses in the middle to be able to use for computers or devices, right? We take those 252 addresses and we split them in half, 
right? And we say, okay, well, this 156 over here, right, is going to be one thing, and this 156 over here is going to be a different thing. And because we can apply firewall rules, and the firewall can be the gateway in some sense, we can actually treat those completely differently, right? Outbound rules on firewall, inbound rules on firewall. We actually did segment the network in a virtual and potentially even physical way, but primarily a virtual way, at the router set, right? Which in this case we said our gateway, our router, is going to be the firewall where we make decisions, right? We can make decisions on an IP per IP basis. As a matter of fact, we can have 252 segments in that case if we wanted to. But it's really hard to keep track of at that point, right? Then I have to keep track of 252 individual pieces of that network. So you tell me 1.47, what is it doing? I don't know, right? Because it's hard to keep that in your head, right? But if you know that your critical subnets are a slash 24 or a slash 23 or a slash 22 or a slash 20, hell, they can be a slash 12, you know, right? Like you can make big subnets. You've got 10.0, right, or, or, or 10 dot all the way. You've got that whole class A network, right, that you can use. And then you can break that into 24s. You can break that into 16s. You can break it into 12s. You can break, like, you can do whatever you need. So you can pick an appropriate supernet, and if your supernet is that slash 8, right, and then you start dividing it down below, well, this particular network, we're only going to have, 50 people in it, these are our accountants, right? But we'll give them space to grow, so we're going to assign them a slash 24, right? But this network over here, this is our server subnet, right? And it's going to be big because we're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of servers, right? It may need a slash 16 of that all to itself. 16 has how many usable IPs in it? Roughly. 65. 65,000 and some change, depending on how you divide it up, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and how many of those are for network controls and the like. So, you can take and you can supernet and subnet in ways that are, A, appropriately sized to the mission that you have inside of that segment, right? Because the last thing that I want to do on accounting is throw out a, potentially a DHCP segment and say, oh, well, this whole segment is a slash 21, but they only ever need 25 addresses, right? That's making my equipment work far harder than it needs to to keep track of all that. Because even if you don't have that address listed, you still have to reserve the memory set for it. Right? So um, it's, it's making equipment work far harder than it's supposed to. So with subnetting, you're able to, to appropriately assize the subnet, right? Because it may not be a 24. Maybe you only have two people that are going to be in a subnet, right? And you give them a slash 29, right? Um, you can assign that subnet to the mission as a part of that supernet, and as such, you can apply very detailed and specific controls at whichever choke point that that subnet comes up at, right? So if it's at, um, you know, an edge firewall, I can apply uh, the policies there, right? And then I can apply greater or, you know, more restrictive policies up and down the stack as I see fit, but I can get really granular and I can actually control the flow of the network data the way that I want to and the way that is appropriate for the mission. So, so is a supernet anything below slash 24? No, a supernet is anything bigger than the segment that you're working in. Right? So if I have, say I'm working on 10 100 0, 0 slash 16, right? Mm -hmm. My supernet could be 10 0, 0, 0 slash 8, right? I could have a, an upstream interface where my, my next bigger network in the division, right, is that slash 8. If I had that 16, I could also have a, a supernet be um, a slash 15 or a slash 14, right, because I segmented that slash 16 from a block of bigger addresses, right? So it's just your next bigger addressable size. Or not next bigger addressable size, next bigger size at which you've chosen to address. Can we argue that a slash 22 is actually a supernet of slash 24? If you configure it that way, but no. You can't argue that a slash 22 is always a supernet of slash 24. Okay. 
Because in, in my case, and, and the way that I, I'm just saying, in my case, <laughs> and we, well, you know, maybe we need to bring some visuals in, in another presentation, right? It is, that's why when I, I got through this uh, subnetting, this is kind of why, or, or this, the segmentation, this is kind of why I changed the, the format of the presentation at the last minute, right? Is um, there's actually a lot to segmenting that it seems very simple up front, but it can be complicated um, to get it right and to make the decisions on it. I will tell you that to answer your question, at my house, I have a dedicated slash 16 that I run for my house, right? I've chosen a particular subnet, and I won't say what it is, but I've chosen a particular, you know, uh, address space as a slash 16. Okay. Well, I have a slash 24 and a slash 24 and a slash 24, and not to give away too much, but the architecture is that their supernet is actually the slash 16 not the next up slash 22. It's how you configure it, right? Because of how you address it. So with some of the, uh, this is more slightly off topic. I know Cisco had some software that they came out with at least a few years ago with some of their newer routers, some of the older routers that they could use that you can actually just use a GUI interface to actually segment a lot of these devices out now. Do you, uh, have you worked with any of this stuff before by any chance, or does it make it easier if you've worked with it before? Sure. I, I haven't worked with Cisco's. I've worked with others, right? Um, I don't know that it makes it easier or not, right? Generally, when we go in and we run the architecture diagram, and by the way, I'm going to state that I am not the world's best network engineer by any stretch of the imagination. I am, I am dangerous enough to configure a switch improperly enough to make it secure, right? Um, there are far, far, more, you know, far better true network engineers that understand all the nuances of, of how the traffic moves, um, and like the QoSing of traffic and, and all of the fine-tuned policies that network engineers do better than I do. I understand it at more than a basic level, right, because I had to secure it, but I don't understand it at a super, super, super advanced level. And I, so I make that disclaimer. But for us, when we look at a security architecture review, right, and, and we're sitting on a SAR, and, and it's because we've decided that this particular part of the network needs to be resegmented or segmented for the very first time, right? We, and we'll get to it later in the presentation, we choose which methodology that we want to, not, and not methodology in a sense of physical or virtual, we choose which methodology we feel that we want to actually choose the segments by, and then we apply which methodology of segmentation is appropriate to each one of those segments. And we'll get to it. So if you want to hold more until we get to that, and if you still have questions, we can answer it then. Um, would we be able to say that, when, when you're saying because it's configured, well, uh, depending on how you've configured it, um, are you saying that because it could be outside of the range of the supernet or is it that we don't necessarily configure the supernet and we have our subnet area no so if i choose 10 1 0 0 slash 16 right to be my home network and i choose 10 1 10 0 slash 24 to be my server subnet right that doesn't mean that if i go slash 23 and I don't know if 24 and 25 would be the, or, or 10 and 11 would be the 23, or 9 and 10 would be the 23, but we're going to pretend for the moment that 9 and 10 are the slash 23. It doesn't mean that 10, 9, 0, 0 slash 23 is my supernet. Because if I try and send that like it's gateway, it's not going to route. My supernet is still 10, 1, 0, 0 slash, or 10, 1, 0, 0 slash 16, right? So 10, 1, 0, 1 at that point. It, it, your supernet depends on your next configured routable state, right? So you can have, if you're really looking at the bottom of a 24 and you decided to use the whole 10 slash 8, in theory, you could have 100 supernets on the way up the stack if that's how you wanted to divide your network. It's, it's how you choose to subnet it and divide it. Subnetting uh, and, and subnetting is outside the scope of, of a segmentation presentation. I think I've gone as far as I can go on that. We can make a subnetting presentation if you want, but I think that I would want a network engineer 
to stand up and explain that to you because there is a uh, black magic art almost to making those choices at times. I don't know where the black magic in the sub. I mean, <laughs> if it's, you have 256 boxes, okay? Uh -huh. You can choose and cut them in half. And the first one, 28, go to Alice's department. The other one, 28, go to some other department, okay? Right, but did you subnet them in that? So did you go ahead and take the 24 and make it a slash 25? Or are you just subnetting the 24 and making policy-based routing decisions at the 24 gateway, at the slash 24's gateway? The first one, I just made it slash 25. Okay, well then your supernet is the slash 24, if, if they both share the same gateway. Okay. If they both share that gateway as okay. their next hop out, right? Okay. However, if each one of those 25's has their own independent gateway, right? Yeah. They may not have a supernet other than to your ISP. Okay. Okay. Again, it's how you configure it. There's not always an answer to this, right? It's, it's choices that you make in your engineering and architecture designs. So in practicality, like I said, it is likely that a combination of techniques is going to be used um, in any network of significant size, right? If we go to AT&T, or we go to McKesson, or we go to uh, the city of Chandler, right? Depending on the size of the network, the missions that are at hand, which if you look at the city of Chandler, right, there's many, many missions at hand inside that city, right? You've got, um, you know, garbage and sewer, right? You've got recycling programs. You've got police departments. You've got fire departments. You've got public communications. You've got accounting, you know, accountants. You've got tax clerks. You've got, you've got thousands of different services that a city has to provide and potentially each one of them has their own network segment with appropriate controls, right? So you, you have to kind of make choices and then you also have physical restraints, right? The city of Chandler, I don't think has a budget, correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, to just run as much fiber as they want underneath the streets to uh, you know, segment things. Right? Like some points you have to make a decision, right? And have these constraints. Well, you know, pay more taxes, I guess, right? <laughs> and I will tell you that the best option is not always the right option. And that may sound counterintuitive, right? But we may say in an ideal security world, the best option is to physically segment this, right? But based on our budget, based on the capabilities of the building, based on the hardware that we have, based on the skills that we have, we, we may not be able to physically segment that, right? Or VLAN may be an optimal and ideal solution, but we don't have a VLAN capable switch, you know, there. And, and we just deploy a, you know, a new Netgear ProSafe and get the job done, the best solution may not always be the right solution, right? So don't get wrapped around the axle in trying to say, well, in the most ideal and secure way, I would do it this way. That's great, but you may have too many constraints um, that prevent you from doing that. Network maps, network maps, network maps, Network maps, network maps, network maps, network maps. I can't tell you how many times we walked in to do a DFIR, uh, uh, you know, digital forensics and incident response, right, um, uh, call. And we walked in and we said, okay, give me your network diagram. Uh, we don't have one. Where, where does everything live? In the server room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which subnet, which segment, which, I don't know. Nine times out of 10 when we walked in and did that, it was on a flat topology, right? So we didn't actually have to have a network diagram at that point, but sometimes there wasn't a flat topology. But if you don't maintain those diagrams, they're, 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 they're gonna be there for more than just compliance or regulatory process, right? And a, and a particular set of compliance standards, you may have to be able to show your regulator or your auditor, right, a, a network map segment. You may have to be able to show this. But when you have your new network engineers come on board because, you know, there's churn, right, how do they know what is what, right? Tribal knowledge only takes you so far. Or if in the unfortunate event that you happen to take, you know, the eyes of whatever new Russian, Chinese, North Korean, Iranian, Indian, 
you name it, pick the adversarial country electronically, right? If you happen to become the, the, the eyes of, or apple of their eyes, right, and they're deploying their newest uh, implant on you, then you have to roll a FIR engagement from a Mandiant or a CrowdStrike or any one of the thousands of companies that will do this for you, get a network map. You're going to have to provide it to them. Or otherwise, they're going to be charging you potentially $1,000 per person per hour that's there to draw a network map for you. Force multiplier. We talked about this. Segmenting a network in and of itself is not a security control, right? Because if you segment everything, but you just allow everything to route unfiltered in and out of those network segments, you didn't actually provide security controls. You did segment, but you didn't provide security controls. What a segmenta uh, segmented network does is allows you to appropriately deploy security controls based on, on decisions that you've made. Um, it makes your appliance is potentially more effective, right? It can potentially reduce the cost of the appliances that you deploy. Deploy. Um, you can limit the scope and the policy of each one of those devices, and you may be able to more conveniently deploy throughout your infrastructure of these devices, right? So your choke points may or may not be in the most ideal locations physically, but if you use proper segmentation, right? you can potentially make your choke points, make your observation points for network flows um, in places that um, are more ideal than uh, the central server closet um, to, to monitor and make you know, decisions on that, right? You can put out IDSs and IPSs into um, you know, distribution closets you know, where your distribution switches are. More segmentation strategies, and this is what you and I, Sebastian, were talking about a few minutes ago, but um, sometimes you just segment it by physical or geographic location, right? Your office in Chandler is one network segment, your office in Gilbert is a network segment, your office in Phoenix is another network segment, or your office in San Francisco is one network segment, your office in Washington, D.C. is a wholly different network segment, right? It's a valid strategy, potentially especially if each one of those offices has a different role in activity, right? My accountants are in DC, my lawyers are in Chicago, my software developers are in San Francisco, and my sales and marketing staff is in uh, Dallas, right? In that case, I could potentially segment everything just by geographic location and be fine. But you can also choose to segment by user role, especially if you have multiple people in the same location, right? So my accountants need one access policy. My server administrators need another policy. My developers may need a whole separate set of policies, right? Um, and I don't see any reason why my receptionist would need to be able to SSH into uh, the core uh, router, right? Or they shouldn't necessarily need to make, uh, and especially in a large organization, the receptionist has no business being able to SSH into the main email server, right? So we can appropriately apply policies by user rule. Or we can say, hey, we're going to turn that on its head, and we're going to say that workstations have this level of access policy, and web servers have this level of access policy, and email servers have this level of access policy, and database servers have this level of access policy, and that's how we're going to define and segment our network, right? That's valid depending on what your mission is and depending on how you want to implement your controls. You may decide that data type is actually what you want to do because all database servers may not be created equal, right? The database server holds, um, you know, social security numbers and other things for your, uh, your personnel record system um, may need a significantly different set of controls on it than the database server that holds inventory availability, right, for your website. Completely different database sets, right? Completely different potential rule accesses. So think about this. How hard would it be in a large organization, and part of the reason that segmentation can be so um, difficult and time consuming to do, how hard is it to walk in in a 50,000 person organization and define every user role that you have? It, it could take years. I mean, it does take some organizations years to really define that and get ready to do it. 
And by the time that they're done defining that, it's changing again, right? Think about that same organization and say, how, what are all the different types of data and the classifications of those data that we have, right? It's, it's, it's painful. It can take a long time. It can be hard to do. And that goes to the whole data value, right? Classification of your data. Not all data is created equal, right? The value of a credit card number or a social security number, right, to an attacker is a lot different than the value of uh, my internal skew to external representation on my website, right? The, those are two very different values of data, right? Um, the SEC filings that a public company is going to make in 10 days with the SEC have a very, very different value for those, you know, nine days between the time that they're, you know, signed and drawn up and filed and the time that they become public than, um, say, the product that they launched three weeks ago. Um, there may be some engineering schematics that will become public but haven't become public yet, right? It depends. Like, you have to classify that data, but that actually takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of discussions. And one of the things that typically breaks down when people try and segment by data is that the security crew is not uh, traditionally well known for playing well with other business units, right? Because we're the people that walk in and say, nope, you can't do that. Nope. Can't. Nope. Can't do that. No. Oh, you want a Slack server? No. Can't Or a Slack account? Nope. Can't have that. Oh, you want to use, uh, you know, DigitalOcean for, you know, a virtual hosting? Of, nope, can't do that. We got to bring it in-house. You want to use Dropbox because it's easy? Nope, can't do that, right? Like, we go, no, 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 right? And it, it's created friction with business units and not well known for playing nicely with others. So that can make it really hard for us to go in and get a really candid talk with um, product development or, um, the software development team or the accounting team as to what the actual value of each of the data types that they use are. So it's not, um, it's not as trivial as we would like to think. And that's the majority of what I have to say other than to answer questions. So. How often do you find a switch these days that cannot segment networks? Often. Very often. Especially in small and medium business, right? They went and they bought the 16 port net gear and they didn't buy the ProSafe model that was $80 more expensive because it had a managed interface, right? Um, so it has to be a managed interface on the switch to do VLAN. To, 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 to do VLAN. Right, yeah. Well, you can segment using a firewall. You can segment using an IDS or an IPS. There are lots of different ways to segment, right? But if you're going to do virtual segmentation and, and VLAN set, like I guess you can apply the VLAN policies at the firewall, and they're going to have to go way up the stack and back down versus to go to the switch to make decisions. But ultimately, if you're going to want to do VLANs, you need to get a managed, what's called a managed switch. And it may not have a GUI on the front of it, right? It may just have a... a some of them only support Telnet, right? You may tell that to the switch. You may SSH to the switch. You may not have anything like that. You may actually have to plug a console cable up to it, right? And console into the switch to do it. But you're going to have some kind of software interface on that switch by which you can make decisions on ports, right? Uh, on, a, on a separate thought for that, um, if, we were to have, if we were to get one of those Nike routers that are rather cheap, are you at all familiar with the open source firmware and whether or not those tend to go with software for segmentation? Or if that is a hardware thing needed too? Well, I mean, part of it is if you're, if you're using ASICs on a switch, right, that don't have, you know, the awareness of VLAN, you can put the software on it all day long. You may not be able to support that, right? Your ASICs may not have the instruction sets necessary to support the VLANs. Yeah, or the CPU set to support it. Um, I, that is the level of network engineering that's beyond me. Um, I do know that there are a number of switches that you can buy that basically do not come with operating systems on them, right? And you can go buy, or in some cases they're free, um, switch operating systems, right? And part of that open switching project, and you can put your own chosen OS on it. And then there's something like 
I think Cumulus was one of them. And there are a number of Linux distributions that are basically designed to go out on switches and become, you know, a switch slash router, um, you know, on open, openness source hardware. Yeah. And there are virtual switches, right? There are all kinds of switches. Is there some of this that could apply to typical home users? Family might have six devices or something, and because everybody's got absolutely you know, the Wi-Fi access point, it's got a switch, it's got a router, it's got Wi-Fi, it's everything in one, and you you pwned that and you pwned everything. So well, not only that, I will tell you that um, much to my children's anger, right? They have a very different network policy than the adults in our house, right? Um, their network speeds are curtailed at certain points of the day, right? I use QoSing to apply, like, I don't know, past 9 p.m. I don't have arguments with my kids about getting YouTube off YouTube at 9 p.m., right? I don't have to. Because their network segment that they use is QoS to 2K at 9 p.m. So have fun watching YouTube. Um, if you're willing to let that, the video buffer for six hours so that you can watch the eight-minute video, right? Like, Whatever it is. So it absolutely does. I have IoT devices. I like my IoT devices, but I don't trust them. Not at all. They get their own segments. So in my house, there are actually five tiers of network segments. They each have their own complete different. Uh, some of them are physically separated. Some of them are, are VLAN separated. Even some of the ones that are physically separated actually exist in a VLAN for a, a number of reasons, right? But at the end, I have multiple network segments. My IoT devices cannot talk into the house, right? Um, they can go talk to the internet. That's what they need to talk to. There's no reason that my IoT device should be talking to my VM host that sits underneath the desk that's running my test data or my my test SQL database, right? There's also no reason that. Um, my wife's iPhone and my kid's iPad should be talking to uh, computers that I only use for work, right? Being that I work from home. So, um, you know, yes, absolutely. Network segmentation heavily applies to the home. It's just whether you want to manage that or not, right? So my, my family often, I, I hear the complaint of, but why doesn't it just work like everybody else's when I have to go expand the DHCP pool because I only let a couple of DHCP addresses be hanging in the wind, right? Because I don't want somebody to come attach 40 devices into the slash 24. I don't care if there's plenty of address space for it, right? I don't know that I have a reason for those that many, right? So we leave a couple extra DHCP devices, right? So friends come over, and one of their devices gets on, and a second device gets on, and the third friend is angry as, you know, I'll get out because they're trying to play Minecraft or whatever else it is together, right? And the third friend can't get on the network segment because i got to go expand the DHCP pool temporarily for them. So in, in, in my little amount of experience with the managed switch, I know there's an option on it to have a VLAN or to have a port that mirrors another port. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm very curious, you know, we hear a lot about the, uh, the management engines and all these things that are, you know, uh, AMD has something similar in, in theirs that, that could potentially disrupt, interfere, or inject network traffic. And I'm just curious, is there, you know, is there a, a Linux kernel modification or something that, you know, basically if you have something that's mirrored or if you have another device out there or if you have some software running in your router. So basically, I want to detect all the packets that I don't think my computer actually sent. Yes, so now, when you talk about what the, 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 I guess the most frequent term in the industry for what you're talking about, a mirror, right? It's called a span port, right? And it just says, hey, I'm going to send a mirror image of all the traffic that comes across this port to another port. Generally, what you use for that, or those are used for things like paid witness, um, is what we call them, right? IDSs instead of IPSs, the detection systems instead of the prevention systems, right? So an IDS and an IPS are functionally the same, except for one sends off to the side and says, hey, I saw something bad happen, right? And that's the IDS, and the IPS is actually inline traffic, and something bad starts to happen. It says, hey, something bad's happening. I'm stopping that flow of traffic, right? So I call those paid witnesses. 
So what you're talking about is a more active role. So a span port is not going to be what you want to run for that, right? You would use something like an IDS or an IPS um, based system, right? And you can use uh, Snort or Suricata, um, you know, Bro. Um. Well, I, I guess my real question is, you know, <coughs> you want to talk about, well, in this, this Intel management engine could be doing something. But I want to know, has anyone actually detected it actually injecting packets? I don't know. I mean, me personally? No. So, I mean, what, it, what, why haven't we heard about, well, somebody has detected it, or why haven't we heard that somebody's done an analysis and it does not inject it? Why haven't we heard that? Well, how are they? How do they know it's been injected? Because if you if you the computer knows all the packets it's sending, so it can flag them, or it can duplicate them, or it can you know do something. Maybe, but I can modify a packet and then demodify a packet, and you not be aware of it at all because I modify it after you've sent it and before you receive it back, right? So I can modify your response, and that would be something like an SSL man in the middle attack, right? The thing is, the, you, know, you, you sent packets through your ETH zero or whatever, mm -hmm. and you have a program, okay, that's you know doing stuff that's logging them or doing something with them or computing a checksum or whatever, sending it to a database. On this side of the Ethernet, now of course I, I, I realize the management engine could be you know monitoring everything, but you should be able to detect. In other words, if you have a record a record of all the packets you think you sent. And then you can look at all the packets that actually got sent, and if they're different, then you have a problem. You know, then the management engine has injected something. Yeah, sure. So you're talking about basically doing some kind of a checksum or a hashing algorithm on all of the outbound packet that you're getting ready to bundle up and send, and then storing that locally, and then having a mirror. I guess you could write that. I don't know if anybody has or has not written that. I, I guess that's a way to detect it. I haven't thought about doing that. It, it's been so many years, I'd be rather shocked if somebody hadn't done that to see whether or not it's actually doing that. Doing that in real time is going to be computationally prohibitive, right? Um, so I think that, I mean, that's... The potential to be compromised does not mean always compromised. Like the management engine has the potential to be compromised. Right. But, but that I, doesn't mean it's actually doing anything. Right. But I, I, I'd like to know if anybody has forced it into, you know, if in other words, you know... The easier so, way to do that would just be look at outbound traffic and, you know, if you're seeing traffic to load the destinations that you're not going to, then you have some, right, well, I'm some saying, issue. I, I, I'd like but, to know whether anyone has actually ever detected the management engine injecting a packet or not. Because that's really valuable information. Is it, is it just a theoretical thing, or can we make it happen? You're right. It is very valuable information. Of what I know, I, I don't know that I've heard anybody make that claim. Right? Um, that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. And you're right. That's very very valuable information and with the ubiquity of where that's deployed and the potential mitigation problems with that, right? If you look at places like NSA or, or others, right? There's an equities process in disclosing vulnerabilities um, or the, the proof of concept set to exploiting a vulnerability. So there may be uh, three letter agencies from our government or other governments that absolutely know that, but because of the equity um, of of denying it or, or, or not denying it, uh, you know, could change, could, could, could change the world of, you know, as we know it, right, in, in some ways. Um, so you may never know about it. I, I don't know anybody that does that. If you wanted to, I mean, one of the ways that you could look at it is, or what you talked about is, is hashing that. As far as that being said, though, I, I don't know that the inject for the packet is actually meant for your ETH0. And if my understanding of how the, um, the management engine works, it's kind of sidelined and parallel to that stream as well. So it may not be inside the packet you send. It may be in a complete, like, <sighs> I know that, I don't know that it can inject it straight off the card that, you know, the data set that's coming off your card. It may be a completely different data stream that's coming back and then doing acting. But uh, I'm not an expert in that arena, so I will decline to um, like 
confirm or deny anything. Like, you see what I'm saying? Like, I, I can think of ways that it could happen. I just don't know that they're realistic because I don't know. No, I just don't know that they're realistic in how I'm explaining it. Yeah, well, you know. Yeah, because, yeah. Um, no, I'm like, I'm, what I'm saying is, like, I believe that what you're saying might be possible, it might be plausible, but I don't. I don't know enough about it, so I'm, I'm spitballing with you. Like, I can think of ways that it could be used, but I don't know if that's, like, practical or possible actually. It just may be theoretical, like you're saying. Any other questions about network segmentation? Because I do want to do, by the way, presentations on firewalls. I do want to do more presentations on IDS and IPS. And, like, we'll come in here and we'll build a PFSense firewall, right? We'll write some rules. Um, PF sense because that's what I'm most familiar with, right? But then we can use Snort, we can use Suricata, and we can talk about, you know, detecting certain things inside of packets and how we look at side of headers, right? So if we see a packet that starts with 789C, what do we know about that packet? Or the payload inside that packet, if the payload is 789C. It's gzipped. So before we can make any, you know, or, or uh, zlib Z compressed, right? So before we can make any decisions on that packet, what do we have to do? Uh, decompress it, right? So like, that's that's not. A, I mean, that is a network fundamental of security, right? But it's not for this presentation. I'd love to do presentations about that and get into certain things and, and looking at that stuff. Um, and I think that that's more in line with what you're talking about. And SANS does a whole course on intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems. Um, and I think it's about 30, anywhere from between 30 and 40 hours of class and lab work. Um, and it's not necessarily easy. And you learn a lot about packet level stuff and exactly what you're talking about. Without the fact that I don't, when I took that class, they weren't focusing on the Intel management engine. Right? It, was, it was general intrusion detection stuff, but it was understanding how a packet works, right? It was understanding your header lengths and, and other things and actually doing traffic inspection um, so that you could write rules for your IDS and IPS as well as confirm whether the rules that you're getting from your, your IDS or IPS rule vendor, right, are doing what they claim that they do. My comment is if we can have visuals, that would help. Yeah, well, we gonna, we're going to kind of have to figure that out. That was the other reason with the firewall set is I've got to work with Brian to figure out how we can, like, we can set that up, right, um, so that we yes, can see it. You mentioned the example. I don't want to know your house, but here's someone's house. There are two kids, and these people work in IT, so they have a couple of IT boxes. They have two kids playing, you know, these. They have the wife. They have this. They have that. Here's an example how you segment. It's not the one solution, just an example, okay? I see things how they get protected. Yeah, the IoT just go to the internet, that's it, let them burn. <laughs> <laughs> but then what if you need your phone to talk to the IoT device? But I assume that the kids are on one Wi-Fi, where you can control the DHCP, so you say you can get five addresses, so if more, if six friends come in, you know, they're out of luck, unless you change the DHCP number. Give me a second. Okay. All right, let's see if we can do this live here. <laughs> Big eye, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Firewall. Okay. I'm going to draw a little fire on top of it. Let's put the next W today. You can, you know, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Much easier. Looks like a house. It's damaged, but it's more. We're going to address it 10.0.0.1. Okay. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what's our subnet mask? Shh. Okay. Slash eight. Okay. No. We're gonna have a big one. No, we're not having that big one. All right. Okay. So then, 
we really like IoT devices. <laughs> so we've got I'm gonna call it IOC, our internet of crap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have a toaster, a refrigerator, a whatever. Pie, something, whatever, a turbo, smart light bulbs, <laughs> space heaters. And we've got this switch, right? <laughs> and they're useful. The switch comes here to a particular port on the firewall, which is acting as a gateway. And okay. that address is ten. Dot one dot zero dot one dot one slash sixteen. Right? And we said that our ten dot one slash sixteen is our Internet of Crap segment. Right? And we can put some span ports or some inline ports before it gets down here, and we can put an IPS. And the only thing that we care to look for in this IPS is scanning activity at that device or that device doing scanning or DDoS based activity, right? Because it's not cameras that are watching, you know, the inside of the house or anything that we would consider super sensitive, right? It's just our refrigerator that's telling us whether we're out of milk or not, or, you know, the doorbell camera, you know, that shows the front of the house that anybody can see anyway, right? We decided it's not terribly sensitive. So the only thing that we don't want become a bad apple on the internet by DDoSing stuff because we somebody found a vulnerability in our uh, you know internet of things device right and we would just hope that we don't want people to enumerate us right so that IDS or that IPS we set the only thing that it has is anti DDoS and anti scanning rules in it right other than that if it goes to porn sites or it goes to you know whatever sites we don't care because that's, well, you know, they're used for proxies quite frequently, um, right? A hacked router or, or where, like, that's frequently a proxy device, right? But we're not going to care about that. If it becomes a member of a botnet, as long as it's not DDoS botnet, we're just not going to care, right? We're going to let it do its thing, right? So, um, over here, we have our super secret segment. We care much about this, right? This is the computer that we use to do online banking. This is the computer that we use to do online shopping, right? So credit cards get um, entered into this, right? Or we may pay our taxes on this computer, so our social security number gets put on this, or we might actually scan our tax forms on and you know store them there, right? Like there's lots of sensitive information, so we can segment this in its own slash eight as well, and we or slash sixteen as well, and this can be ten dot two dot zero dot one. My apologies for my terrible drawing here, but and it can have a whole other firewall down here, right? And then this can be 10.2.1.0 slash 24, or 1.1 slash 24, right? And this part of the network segment has its own firewall over here. And because I've decided that on that super secure set two, I want to do my work from home stuff. So I've got another firewall over here, and it's 10.2.1. 2.0 or dot one slash 24 and that's the work and again my apologies and there are IDS and IPS and firewalls there and by the way do you now see why I said it's about choices that you make about your subnet slash supernet because what's the supernet for this work network The, the work network down at like this network right here. What's its supernet? Doesn't it technically have multiple? Yeah, it does have the multiple. What's what's its primary? Its first supernet. I would say the ten zero zero one eight slash eight. No, it's the ten two sixteen. Ten two zero one sixteen. 
That's its first hop out the door. And then its next supernet is the 10.0.0.1 slash 8, right? It's got a 16 supernet before it goes to its 8 supernet. But this Internet of Crap network down here, what's its supernet? Right. No, it's the 8. Again, the 8 is its supernet, right? That's its link up where I said it connected into that firewall. That firewall has a different segment address, whether it's a VLAN segment or a physical segment. That's why I say subnets make things easier, right? But it's not the end-all, be-all, which subnets, which supernets. It's, that's, that's not the end-all, be-all of it, right? We can, we can segment it a thousand different ways with subnetting to accomplish the same thing. Subnetting really is just about making it easier to like, think about, right? To visualize in your head or, or to, to run out. When I know that this slash 16 is protected this particular way because this slash 16 is my server subnet. Whether it's a you know, subnet or a super, you know, whether it's supernet is a slash 12 or whether it's supernet is a slash 8 or whether it's supernet is a slash 2 doesn't really matter, right? It was all about breaking it up in a way that the size of the network fits the mission at hand, right? Is an appropriate size and it's hopefully got some room for growth, right? You don't want to completely limit what you're doing, right? So you want to leave some room for growth. And then it makes it easy for us to just think about that network as a segment. In theory, you could have every one of your segments be 10.1.0.1 slash 16 inside of that slash 8 and do a ridiculously complicated set of NATs and like segment every segment on the same, sub like it's, it's just, it's, it's what you decide and what you engineer and about how to make it easy to think about. Yeah. Do you have any good uh, segmentation tips in terms of like what's some good theorizations or practices that you would potentially put on a network and how you do your segmentation? Or ideally, we, ideally, we do a combination of user access roles and data classification roles, right? So when we think about workstations, we classify those by the need of the user that sits behind that workstation and what they need to access. And then when we go kind of more towards the server side, we segment those and place different controls on them kind of based upon what data resides inside of those servers, right? So it's really a blended. That would be my deal, but you know, I will tell you that I've been places where that's not easily possible because they have God's own VM host, right? And, and they bought you know, a $25,000 server to run KVM machines on or run VMware on, right? And every one of their machines that does you know, their critical data and every machine that does non-critical data is sitting kind of in the same place and they didn't segment them where there's VLANs inside of that virtual switching at all, right? So you can't do that. Um, so in that case, ideally, we would provide the most restrictive policy that we can to every machine in that network. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. I mean, it's, it's what, what you're working with. But I would tell you that my, my best recommendation would be to classify your data, classify your users, and then figure out what the mapping is between that to be able to segment that way. And it's hard. So for the average non-computer person, they're just going to be running DHCP for everything, right? Mm -hmm. Are they pretty much hopeless? Like, there's no real way to segment. It's only physical at that point, right? I don't know. I'm not a major league baseball player, but is it hopeless for me to hit a 95 mile an hour fastball? Yes. <laughs> it's just much harder for me to hit a 95 mile an hour fastball, right? Um, I don't think it's hopeless. I think it's as hopeless as we make it. And, and, and from two sides of it, right? Is there a realistic way to handle it versus well, I think, adding static Well, I think part of that is we're going to have to engineer practical solutions into devices that, you know, are, you know, like, or not, 
I think you were talking about the Cisco GUI, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Like a, a Cisco GUI that makes it dead simple, right? Yeah. Whether it's Cisco or whoever puts it out, right? We're going to have to engineer um, things into devices that make it practical, right? Um, but at the same time, um, and when you did your presentation on you know devices and security and creating your own microservices and the like, if you remember, I challenged you on users securing those microservices. Yeah. And Microservices? We were like running like a Perl server or something, doing oh, like some web stuff up here, right? Like modules. Do what? Sorry. I don't know, it was the first week I showed up to <laughs> plug. <laughs> and I don't remember all the specifics, but I remember one of the things that you were showing was, you know, like you can create your own web service. You can create, you know, all kinds of your own things. And one of the things that I told you was like, but is that a good idea? Because if Joe Snuffy just creates all of his own stuff, and it's not skilled enough to secure it, then it kind of becomes like a menace to the internet, right? Especially if it's, you know, found a nice neat flaws about that. My point to that is, it's going to be a problem as much as we make it a problem. We're gonna to have to engineer solutions in it, but the other part that we're gonna to have to do is we're just gonna to have to educate people on this stuff, right? And if you decide that you want to run 12,000 IoT devices in your network, we're going to have to adopt policies on, uh, you know, uh, ISPs and, and, and regulatory and, and legal, you know, policies that basically say, hey, if you're going to put 10,000 vulnerable devices on your network and you're going to fail to secure it, then you're potentially responsible for the amount of damage that you cause to the internet or cause to your neighbor or whatever it is, right? So, um, in a lot of ways, that's up to us. One of the ways that we change this is we do things like this. We educate the masses, right? And I don't think that I'm going to give anybody, a, you know, make them an IPS pro overnight. They may not ever become an IPS pro, right? But there are things that we can do to point them towards either managed security services or default out of the box configurations that may not be entirely secure, but are more secure and more better than what they're currently running. And the internet is what we make. <laughs> <laughs> hmm.